out of modernism, this, 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 this um, period of modernism, that's was called, um, it came, came a large-scale rejection of God and just general sort of religious skepticism. Um, and, yeah, mankind just felt that he had... Um, he felt that he could understand himself by his own acquired knowledge. Now, modernism was the birthing ground for movements such as atheism and just general sort of religious skepticism. Philosophers such as um, Friedrich Nietzsche, which we're probably most familiar with because he was the most famous, the guy who said, God is dead, um, he remains dead and we have killed him. Um, that was his view on sort of mankind, where we were going. And then came World War I and World War II, and all this great hope that mankind had built, uh, that modernism stood on, sort of began to crumble and then entered postmodernism. Now, postmodernism is a reaction or an overreaction, really, to modernism. Okay? It was, it's important to note earlier that postmodernism's dangers come from its overreactionary sort of extremities that of the ideals of modernism that it was trying to fix. And, um, so a simple explanation of modernism probably is the philosophical age that we live in, we are currently in, um, and it holds to the view that there is no objective, ultimate, or absolute truth. All truth is relative, especially when it comes to things like the arts and spirituality and, and religion. Everyone is free and encouraged to decide their own truth and then and base their lives on that. And if that doesn't seem super revolutionary to you, then that's probably a bit of an indication of how much this has injected into our culture and changed our way of thinking. So I see a lot of our heads just eyes glazing over and heads starting to bobble. So let's land this plane with a bit of a phrase that will sort of boil it down to its bones and help us sort of understand essentially what it is. <clears throat> In a postmodern world, when presented with an absolute truth claim, say, for example, Jesus Christ is the only way to God, heaven, eternal life, then a postmodern world would say, that might be right for you, but that's not right for me, and you shouldn't be pushing your ideas on me. That might be right for you, but that's not right for me. There's this idea of no objective truth, only relative truth, that an individual can decide for himself what is true and what isn't. Okay, now with that basic understanding laid, let's get to the real work. Let's jump into God's Word. Um, John 14, please. <clears throat> and we'll probably... Yeah, let's read from verse 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself... And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How, how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is a really cool and profound little bit of scripture. We've gone through it like in our passage through John but in, the, in this night, in the somberness before the, the cross and Christ, all the agony that's going to happen the next day to him, um, I, I, I sort of get the feeling that he is genuinely excited here. He's telling his disciples, look, I'm going away to my father's house. I'm going to get rooms for you. I'm going to come back and get you. It's going to be great. We're going to live forever. It's going to be awesome. And you know the way. You know the way to where I'm going. You know, you know where I'm going. And then Thomas comes in. No, we don't, Jesus. No, no idea what you're talking about. You know, are you guys getting this? Like, is it just me? You know, what's what's going on? How how can we know the way? Where are you going? What is the way? And then Jesus answers him, "I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." Now, these three claims of of Jesus. Uh, we're going to sort of form our basis, our skeleton today, as we, as we walk through and explore um, why it's important for God's ultimate truth to reign and cut into our lives. So the I am statement at the start there, we've discussed that probably in length as we've gone through, um, gone through John, you know, it's, it's another one of Jesus' hints that he is the, indeed the great I am, the God Almighty. We've mentioned that fairly heavily, so I'm not going to go into it anymore, but I am going to make just a sort of mention 
towards next week's sermon about time. We're going to discuss how the great, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> how the great I am God can say he is I am in the past, in the present, and in the future without getting his English class tenses wrong. Okay, because he is the almighty king of the universe. This weird little English language that we like to hang on to and get right so much is just, you know, nothing for him. So we're going to look at that next week. So stay tuned. So let's start with Jesus is the way. Okay. So I was cleaning out some of my stuff the other day. Um, You know, those boxes of things that you carry around, little keepsakey sort of stuff that carry, move with you from house to house and you never go through them. Well, one of those big boxes was taking up space in our room. My good wife told me to go through it. So I went through it, and there was cool things in there from when I was a teenager and trinkets when I was a kid. And I, found, I stumbled upon some old yearbooky sort of things from my grade 12 year. And um, I was just reading some of the comments in there. You know how when it gets to the end of grade 12, those of us have been there. You know what I'm talking about. Those of us who haven't, then you're not missing much. The... Um, the nice comments that everyone seems to write in there, oh, you know, I love you, you're so great, you know, whatever. Um, I hated you all year, but, you know, whatever. I'll write this down to make myself look good. Um, (coughs) Those kind of things, it's all in pink pen and and whatever. I was just reading some of these quotes and just marvelling at the wisdom that comes from the mind of a 17-year-old. Now, 17-year-old's here. (laughs) I love you guys, and I'm sure you're a whole lot more clued on, Joe, than my high school class was, but anyway... Here are some of the pearls of wisdom that that I came across. Don't change ever. Okay? (laughs) Looking back, I'm pretty glad I did because my hairstyle was terrible. (laughs) Um, And here's another one. Follow your passion. Okay? If I actually did follow my passion, I'd probably be arrested and in jail by now. (laughs) How about this? Follow your heart. Okay? Okay? It's not, not too bad. Like, and then as I was reading that, the realisation of, sort of what was going on just kicked me in the chest and my mind just went to that verse in Jeremiah where it talks about the heart. What is the heart? Deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can know it? So anyway, I thought it was really cool how the great I am God had caused these to be written down. So 17 years later, that's right, that was half my, year ago, half my lifetime ago. I am getting old. <laughs> this time ago, 17 years ago, that the great I am God would cause, him to, like, would cause these to be written down so I could meditate on him 17 years later while I'm cleaning up my box of junk. It was just great. But anyway, here's my thinking with out of these, out of these um, comments that were said to me. And, and, and come with me now. If we really are to follow our current culture's advice okay, and not change and just follow the passions of our heart, then where does that lead us? Okay, our hearts, our hearts are designed to love things. Okay, no matter who you are, if you are a, a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're an atheist, you're agnostic, you're spiritual, you are something. Don't want to even go there with any of that stuff if you just want to rule yourself out entirely. Whatever you are, you're a human, you are an image of God, you have a heart in you that wants to love stuff. Now, because of sin's brokenness, we don't naturally love God and out of our love for him, perfectly love each other. No, our hearts are bent and we go chasing weird things on broken tangents. We love bent stuff. We don't love God. We love a whole lot of things over him. Like We love sex. We love money. We love career. We love power. We love ourself. We love big boys, toys, whole host of different things and anything else like a whole host of things. Imagine a perverted shelf with all the things that we love above God over there. Just choose your poison and love it. That's what our heart wants to cling to and love. I I want to introduce a little bit of an analogy now that um, might help us understand this and so we can sort of relate through the whole whole sermon. Um, Who has seen one or all 50-something parts of the Caribbean movies? Okay, that's cool. Who knows who Jack Sparrow is? Okay, right. Well, there's some of us that don't, so I'm going to catch everybody up. Jack Sparrow is a pirate. Okay, and like the actor that plays him, he's a bit weird and eccentric, and he um, carries around this broken compass. Okay, it's a compass. It never points north. It just swirls around and does its own thing, and 
Why? What is wrong with this dude that he, he carries this around? <clears throat> this compass never points north, goes everywhere. One of the movies, I'm not sure, it might be the second one or something, I think, they make this a plot point, okay? And the, the compass that swells around, they actually develop it and, it find, and we work out that the compass is actually pointing to the object in this world of the most desire of the heart of the person who holds it. Did I say that right? Okay. So if I'm holding this compass, it's going to point to, hopefully, my wife. But it might not. Like, it, it's, that's what it's where the object of my heart, I'd like you guys to think that's where it would point, but, you know, it might, it might not. But anyway, that's my natural heart. And so, understandably, this then compass becomes an object of... Um, prize. Everyone is sort of chasing and hunting everyone else down to get this compass so that they can be led to whatever in this world their heart loves the most, their, their ultimate source of true happiness. That's where they're wanting to get to and they want to attain that. So now imagine that everybody in this postmodern world has a Jack Sparrow's compass that they take direction from in their life. Okay, there is no true north there is no objective point with which to set a bearing or, or just, just a sea of hearts trying to attain, going their own way, whatever they set their love toward. And they're completely ignoring north and they're just blazing their own trail to whatever they have chosen for their heart to latch onto and love from that shelf we talked about earlier. Now, who is to say that that's wrong? Okay. How about some inspired wisdom from the wisest man to have ever walked this earth, aside from King Jesus himself? This guy's name was King Solomon. Okay, he reigned Israel 970, 930 BC for about 40 years. Now, of whom it was said that all the wisdom in the east and of Egypt, he had more wisdom than all the, yeah, he had more wisdom than all the wisdom in the east and of Egypt. Now, I don't know, ancient world, Asia. There's a lot of wisdom held up in there. World superpower at the time, Egypt, a whole lot of wisdom held up in there. There's a whole lot of um, wisdom there, and this guy had more of it. Okay? If he was around today, there'd be people dropping mad lumps of cash everywhere, clambering over themselves to get and sit down and talk to him. You know, Time Magazine, Business Insider, everyone would want this guy to talk to. Anyway, he said this, I wrote this down, Proverbs 14, 12, for those playing along at home. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Notice the wording there is a way. So take your pick of whichever way you want from that perverted shelf we talked about earlier. You know, whatever, career, sex, world religion, drugs, whatever. Set your compass and to pursue whatever seems right to you. Stacks of cash babes, fame. The funny thing is, the guy that wrote this down had all three of them, okay? And he still wrote down what he did. Thank you, Holy Spirit, you know? Ask your heart, your fleshy heart, what seems right? And regardless of what you choose, it is the way, the definite way to death. All choices end up in death. It's like the worst po possible pick-a-path book. Who remembers those books from the 80s and 90s? Knowles is all over it. Um, you know the books where you'd read a little bit and then you'd have a, to make a choice and if you made this choice, you turn this page, you make this choice, you turn this page and then you'd read a bit and then you'd need to make another choice and you'd end up reading the book with your fingers jammed all over it and trying to, oh, okay, I died. I've got to go back to the previous choice to re-choose the choice so that I can possibly end up alive by the end of this book. <laughs> we all know, okay? It's like that except all choices lead to death. It's the worst possible pick-a-path book. <laughs> so what do we do if all of our choices lead to death? Well, we get excited because Jesus, God himself has provided a way. Let's think about a real-world example where every way led to death, okay? The Israelites fleeing slavery in Egypt, Exodus 14... They're cornered off in a little bit of the wilderness, the sea on one side, mountains on the other, <clears throat> world superpower, Egypt, pursuing them from the back with their mighty weapons of chariots. 
Now, what were the options for the Israelites? They could probably, one, they could probably scatter up into the mountains and be slowly picked off by the Egyptians. It wouldn't have ended well for the kids, the elderly, the terrain, wild animals, climate probably would have killed everybody. That was a way to death. There's another option, maybe they give themselves up to the Egyptians, um, just go back into slavery, except they were a long way away from home, so the Egyptians probably would have killed off all the weak ones, so they could march all the strong ones back, once again ending in slavery, which is death. They could swim, if they were iron men, they could swim across the sea, try. Once again, all the livestock would die, all their equipment, elderly, children, everyone would die. Maybe the strongest swimmers might make it to one side, but then what? They're stuck in a desert with nothing and they die. Every way leads to death. Until God steps in to his people um, and provides a way for them way through the ocean, through the sea, on dry land, and a path for them to walk on, through to promise, through to the new land, through to freedom from slavery. Likewise, in the same way, God has provided his son Jesus as a way out for mankind, out of its predicament. Jesus is the only way to life. Now, Jesus is the truth. Now, as, as we learned earlier, postmodernism dismisses any objective truth. Okay, so it sets up a showdown with Jesus in one corner and postmodernism, or let's call it really what it is, a man-made philosophical way of thinking in, in the other corner. Okay, king of the universe, man-made way of thinking. King of the universe, man. I know whose corner I want to be in. Okay, but now I understand that not everyone listening or maybe even not everyone here um, is in Jesus' corner. This idea of faith is just too much for you to comprehend or handle. And it's easy for you to place your belief in what you understand and, and the idea that someone else has made, um, that everyone can have their, uh, their version of truth, and that seems pretty compelling to you. Okay, So this is for my sceptic friends that might be here, might be listening. I don't want to bag you out because there was once a time when I wasn't in Jesus' corner either. So... Let's just consider this relative truth worldview for a moment. Okay? In a world where all truth is proclaimed, as, is proclaimed by philosophers as being relative and there are no absolutes, then what are we to make of the claim that all truth is relative? See, to me that sounds like an absolute truth claim. I'll say that again. If you live by the idea that truth is relative, <clears throat> then you are in fact claiming an absolute truth in your life. And that truth being that all truth is relative. Well, this is a direct contradiction of the system itself. Okay? And it's where the postmodern worldview just falls apart really before it should be getting started. It can't stand under its own laws. Now, it's like me standing up here. If you, none of you knew me, it's like me just coming here and standing up and saying, Everything I say is a lie. Okay, so everything he says is a lie, which means that he's lying about that, which means he's telling the truth. But if he's telling the truth, then everything he says is a lie. <laughs> you see, in a world where truth is proclaimed as being relative, contradictions and conflict will, will abound. To relate it back to the Jack Sparrow's compass analogy, if everyone's compass is pointing in different directions instead of north, then how many collisions are there going to be? You know, one person wants one thing to be true, another person wants the opposite to be true. Pfft, conflict. The, this postmodernism relative truth view is evident in the way even that news reports are conducted these days. Once upon a time, a news reporter would come out and he would state, this happened. These days, news reporters say what happened and then they have a panel of two or three more people competing as to why their view of what happened is right. Now, disagreeing about personal taste and opinion, like whether orange marmalade tastes good or not, it's delicious, by the way, Camille, uh, is fine, okay? But the danger lies in blurring the lines between opinion and truth. Reinterpreting the truthful realities of this world and encouraging other people to do them 
leads to the cases like the 52-year-old Canadian guy who thinks he's a six-year-old girl. Now, I, I feel for that guy as he's obviously unwell. But instead of helping him, there's this wave of postmodern culture sort of carrying him along and holding him up as a brave forerunner. So with this worldview, what grounds do people have for getting mental help for their conditions? The relative truth system is born in shaky contradiction, okay, and it encourages more inconsistencies and contradictions and conflict as it grows. So, what is real truth? What is the unshakable, objective truth standard that all other truths can be derived from? <clears throat> Let's think for a moment how we, how we prove truth. Okay, if you, say you're a, you're a witness and you're in a court case for some whatever reason and you're called up front to give evidence, what do you do, what does the court make you do to prove that you're telling the truth? <clears throat> Commonly, as has been done for centuries, um, you'd be asked to swear on an authority higher than yourself. That's usually been the Bible. Now, despite what you think about that, um, you are claiming... Um, that what you say will be vouched for by a higher authority or punished if what you punished by that higher authority if what you say is wrong. Now, interesting as a side note, and law expert Gabs dug this up for me. Um, you can actually choose to swear by the state, which is a higher power than yourself, which will vouch for you if what you're saying is right or punish you if what you're saying is wrong. Now, this is even more interesting that Gabby dug up for me. As proof of our postmodern culture, you can actually choose to swear by yourself. In effect, claiming yourself as your own high authority. So, humanity is elevating itself to a point of ultimate authority. Romans 1, I think, is all over that. So anyway, back to our original point, okay? If the idea of telling absolute truth is always to appeal to an authority higher than yourself, then where does that leave our God of the Bible? Who can he swear by to prove that he is telling the truth? If this is where we want to go, we want to know God's telling the truth. Who, who does God swear by to say that he's telling the absolute truth? We're told in Hebrews uh, 6 that he had to swear by himself when he made that promise to Abraham because there was none higher. There was none higher. He couldn't go up to the next level of authority to, to claim truth in them. There is no one bigger than him. Absol absolute, absolute truth is held in him. Okay, and in Jesus' prayer to his father in John 17, he says, your word is truth. And in Jesus' closing remarks of his Sermon on the Mount, he's like, everyone who hears these words and does them, he's like the wise man, <coughs> excuse me, who builds his house on the rock. Now, we all know that story. We sing songs about it in Sunday school. Well, at least I know I did. Um, and... It's such a great picture of our worldviews. If you build your standards of truth around God's absolute word, like God's absolute truth, and you derive all your truth from that, then you will have a rock-solid foundation on which to build your life and when the storms come, and to navigate from when the storms come. If you don't, if you go constructing truths out of what seems right in your heart, as postmodernism culture would tell you to do, then when the storms come, you will be conceding on all fronts. You will be making up truths on the fly. There will be inconsistencies, will be popping up like weeds. You'll get out the, the, the gap filler with lies written on it and you'll be filling all those gaps, boom, 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 and then painting over it with truth-coloured paint. So your foundations in that house will fail and you will fall. Now, I'm wearing a belt today. I know you all came here to hear this sermon about a belt. Um, no, I was wearing a belt the other day too at work as part of my general business attire. And it's more of a style accessory. I don't, didn't think it really formed any sort of functional purpose. I thought just a style accessory with just general work attire. Or so I thought. Until I got into work one day and I sat down heavily and my belt broke. Just where, where, where the keeper little hole is that I use all the time. <coughs> Snap clean in half. Chinese bonded leather apparently is just not what it used to be. Um, 
So I, I, I pulled the belt out of my pants, and I can't walk around with a broken belt all day, I'm just going to look like a numpty. Um, then I as I was pulling it out, I realised that my uh, ID card and my swipe card were clipped to my belt. I thought, oh, that's annoying. So I stuffed them in my pocket, pulled the belt out, examined it, okay, it's broken, might be able to fix it maybe. Rolled it up, put it on my, on my um, desk, went to work. A couple of hours later, thought, oh, I need to have a bit of a walk around. I stood up and my pants slipped, more than would be considered safe in an office. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's really annoying. So I tucked my shirt in all the way around really tight to think that, you know, maybe I'll go and eat 20 burgers at lunchtime and I'll, I'll fill my pants out so I won't fall down. Stuffed my shirt all the way in, walked a few steps, and already my shirt was out. My pants had already slipped that same amount. And I thought, this is really annoying. It's just a belt. Let's, let's look at Ephesians 6. All right, therefore take up the whole, sorry, verse 13, therefore take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Now we know Paul loved admiring Roman soldiers. He pulled out a lot of metaphors from them. He admired their discipline and their, their rank and, and whatever. He has spent a lot of time with them probably while they were guarding him in prison. And... It, did it it's always seemed strange to me that this belt of truth thing that he would mention first, like why not a cool sword or why not a rad helmet or a shield or something? Maybe that's the boy in me, but why the belt first? And see, I had read that passage hundreds of times and it never, ever made sense to me until I was preparing this sermon. So, well, until my belt broke <laughs> while I was preparing this sermon on truth. See, truth is central. It holds everything together like a belt, tools and weapons, um, they hang from it. It holds clothing together, it holds clothing to stop it from getting in the way, yeah, while we're walking and working and, and fighting and whatever. Good, right truth, grounded in God's rock-solid absolute truth, is what everything important for our eternal souls hangs upon and holds together in. And Jesus said it like this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul saw it as truth being central. And it is, as Jesus says it, I, said it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God's absolute truth of Jesus is central in understanding that he is the way to life. Truth stands in the middle there are many ways in this world, many Jack Sparrow's compass set ways that seem right to man, but the truth, God's absolute standard of truth, is the filter on all those ways that are trying to get to life. Now hear me now, this is important, that truth, this truth, Jesus is the truth, God, absolute given truth, is the filter that determines that only one way leads to life. All other ways trying to get through cannot pass. No other way devised by yourself or the world around you will lead you to understanding that Jesus is the way to, the way to life. <clears throat> Attainment of anything that you think will get you there, good works, money, power, Sexual satisfaction, career success, religions of the world, sporting prowess, high levels of education, charity. They're all futile attempts at attaining life. And that's, that's the last we hear of them. Jesus is the truth. The only one way that is the truth that is life. Jesus is the life. 
Now, if you're someone that needs proof of this, then I just encourage you to just go read through the Gospels and study Jesus' life. Um, never once did Jesus do anything <clears throat> or encourage us to think that death was ever really possible with him. Never once did he encourage someone into doing an activity or living a lifestyle that felt right to them that would not be ultimately beneficial for them. His interactions with people were always to teach and encourage and set right and heal and restore, whilst all the while pointing them towards his coming death that would pay for all their sins in a final sacrifice and provide the way back to the Father and eternal life. In his own words, (coughs) as we read, excuse me, no one comes to the Father except through me. Our friends, searchers, skeptics, Christians, disinterested, wherever you place yourself, wherever you are in life, whatever your view of culture is around us, just look at it objectively and ask yourself, how is this working for us? If you see the great ideals of this world lit up in lights, but they're built on like a cracked, shallow, mouldy foundation, just that the lights are distracting you from, then can I beg you just to investigate Jesus? He is the only way amidst the multitude of ways in this world that people are trying. He's the only way that can make it past the truth because he is the absolute truth. He is life because he laid down his life to enable you to stand in front of the one and almighty God, not condemned, but as one approved, covered in Jesus' blood. Consider Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those that find it are few. There are many ways in this world that you're going to be told um, will give you meaning. If it works for you, do, do it. It's just what it is. If it gives meaning to you, do it. It's right for you. These ways are easy to follow as they give us exactly what our natural heart has latched onto and chosen to love. Okay, If your way of life is easy for you at the moment, if, it, if you're just giving in to what your natural way is and it's easy for you to follow, then it's just one of the many ways that are leading down that wide gate leading to destruction. There is only one way through the narrow gate and it is the way of following Christ and it is hard as it requires you to deny your natural heart's desires. Yet, In the end, after this short life is lived, we'll think about this next week, this short life is lived, that hard way leads to life. It's a narrow way, narrow gate. This Entering this narrow gate is a move of submitting humbly to following Jesus' ways. It gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Our new heart will be realigned towards God's absolute truth. We pull back in Jack Sparrow's compass. It's going to be magnetised properly so it always points north. It always points to Jesus. So now instead of running around chasing whatever, you'll have a fixed magnetised compass that you'll be able to build a rock-solid foundation on, an objective truth on which to navigate your life from. That's where we want to be. Now, in closing now, to my, to my brothers and my sisters who follow Jesus as their way, hold him up as their absolute truth standard and trust in Jesus for their life, um, submitting to God's ultimate truth is, is a gift for us as his people. It really is. We have his word. We have his word. That is truth. And we have peace knowing that our eternal security is, is taken care of. This allows us the freedom and authority to boldly stand up and proclaim to anyone in this postmodern, pluralist world the absolute truth of the gospel. And Paul instructed Timothy in this. 
referring to the truth as the upholder here, sorry, referring to the church as the upholder here of truth on, on, on earth. The truth of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth, holding it. The world's trying to tear it down. The world's trying to just make it common that anyone can come up with whatever. We as a church, we are to hold it, uphold that truth. So I encourage you all just to get out there and tell everyone of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have all fallen short of God's high standard. Yet God loves everyone so much that he gave up his only son to die for us so that anyone who accepts his offer and comes through that little narrow squeaky gate on the side with the overgrown path, get off the highway, go through the little gate on the side. Anyone who goes through that gate is on their way to life. Now, for any of those listening that don't know Jesus as their truth in life, um, for getting this far, thank you. And these last words I just want to dedicate to you. Please don't be like the superficial followers of Jesus who heard that he was the way to eternal life and yet they said to themselves, this is a hard saying, who can know it? Who can understand it? Who can listen to it? And they turned back to their old ways. But be like Peter and the disciples who had thrown everything in with Jesus as their only way, their truth standard, (coughs) and their life everlasting, who said to Jesus, Lord, to, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Thanks.